Yeah, so for those of you here and those of you that are going to watch later on, um, I've known Dr. Dyer personally for actually a year from yesterday, I think it was. Um, and I went on a mission trip to Belize with him. Um, and it was one of the best experiences, if not the best experience of my life. Um, and Dr. Dyer worked, he is an ENT surgeon um, and worked in a private practice for quite a long time um, until he stopped doing that and decided, um, I'm sure he can speak more about this than I can, but just decided that God was calling him to do something else. And uh, he's been kind of running Heartfire missions for a long time. And they're a mission organization that works with schools um, to go out and just uh, go all over the country. So I'm sure he has a lot more to say about that. So you can take it away, Dr. Dyer. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. Such an honor to, to be invited into your little group. Um, Drew, Jarena, is that how you say your name? It's so nice that you're here. If you get a chance, I'd love for you to to show yourselves so I can see your pretty faces and um, get a little bit of interaction going on in our Zoom call, if that's a possibility, I don't know. Kyle, are these guys in your class? Do you know? All right. Uh, all right. You're working out? <laughs> the rowing machine, you're making me a little jealous, Drew. Oh my God. Work those lats, work those lats. Um, okay, so I love, oh, awesome. Okay, is it Jarena? Yes, that's awesome. right. All right, are you guys all first years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your class is how big? 230 ish. 230 ish. Gosh. I went to Wake Forest. My medical school, school class was 87 people. And we all got to know each other really well. Wow. Um, well, I love to talk to med students. Um, it brings me back to my days in med school. It seems like yesterday, to be honest with you. You guys are going to blink and you're going to be old like me. And you're going to be talking like this. And uh, I had so much fun, you know, stepping out of my comfort zone, learning, making friendships, and then watching my classmates graduate and spread across the globe. Like you guys have 233 of you that are just going to scatter in three, in three years. And it's going to be really cool to keep up with your peers and watch what they do. And in a blink of an eye, you guys are going to have two really important letters affixed after your name, the M and the D two of the most respected letters. And because of those, people aren't going to call you Mr. and Mrs. They're going to call you doctor. Hey, Daniel, how you doing? And one of the things that has probably happened to you, even though you guys are just, just first year med students. Daniel, are you a first year too? I'm a fourth year. Oh, awesome. Okay, we got a veteran here. Um, Maybe, Daniel, you can recount back to the, your first year. Remember this. You guys probably got, during orientation, a lot of talks. I had an ENT doctor come talk to me during my orientation, and I knew I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon at the time. And he came and told us that the most important organ in the body is the larynx. And I just thought, man, I am never going into ENT if you people think like that. And somehow it happened. But I was taught, and, and my guess is you guys were taught a set of rules, just good rules for students to understand you're moving from college into this new world of medicine and, and you're sort of making your way through trying to figure out what being a doctor is like. And I wanna share four rules that they shared with me and see if these guys, if these rules sound familiar to you guys. First one, live for tomorrow. When you go to med school, it's all about those two words that we all hate, delayed gratification. Did you guys hear that on your orientation? I heard those words literally 5,000 times in my first year of med school. Hey, don't focus on your classmate or your peers that graduated from college and are getting jobs and starting families and buying their first homes. You're gonna get your gratification later. It's all about living for tomorrow. That was the first rule that we got. The second rule was as a physician, you need to understand you need to play it safe. This is not a place to take risks, not with patients' lives, you keep in your company, number two. Rule number three I was taught was be incredibly available for your patients, especially early in your career. Make yourself incredibly available for them. 10 years into your career, once you've established your reputation, then you can start throttling back if you want to and taking Fridays off or whatever, but, but be available for your patients. Give them almost everything. And the fourth rule was never forget to place your family first. Okay, any of these sound familiar to you guys? Do they teach you guys this at University of Texas Southwestern? No, yes, Jarena, give extent, me a hand. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, thank you. So today, if you guys have your Bibles, I want you to open up to Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10. There's a chapter in Mark that actually talks about you, each of you, and we're going to read it today. We're going to talk about these four rules a little bit deeper. So Mark chapter 10, we're going to start with verse 17. Drew, I know you're doing the, the row, but maybe you can pull out your phone and look at the same time. Um, what is the headline of, of that passage of that section of your Bible say? Can somebody share that with me? The rich man. The rich man. Anybody else have something different? The rich young ruler. Rich young ruler. Yeah. Good. Okay. So I'm going to start reading. Mark 10, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and father. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had. I love looking at a story that I've heard a million times and seeing it for the first time again. I'm sure you guys know this, this story. I want to break it down with you because whether you realize it or not, this guy is each of you. This person was young. This person was determined. This person had influence. This person was smart. I don't know where they get the word ruler from in the Bible because it really doesn't say he was a ruler, but he was you guys. This guy was a pre-med student. When we look at these verses, you're going to find a lot in common with each one of you. But before we go there, let me ask you guys this. Do we have any puzzle fans here today? Anybody like puzzles? Daniel likes puzzles. Anybody else? Kyle's like, no, I don't like puzzles. I didn't really like puzzles until I got married and had kids. And then when my daughters were young, we did those like six piece puzzles. You know, that's about my level. And then as they got older, we did a hundred piece puzzles. And pretty soon we were doing 500 piece puzzles. And I have to admit, there's something fun about putting a puzzle on the counter and just every time you walk by throwing on like 15 more pieces and it takes like four days and, and then you get this work of art and then you take it all apart. Well, I'm a completionist and you guys probably are too. That's why you got to med school. You don't just do things until they're done, right? And so one of my biggest peeves, I have a 100 piece puzzle. I put all this time and effort in and at the end, there's one piece missing. Has that ever happened to you? You put a puzzle together and you look everywhere, right? You look under the counter, you look everywhere, like it's gotta be here somewhere. What do you see when you've got 499 piece puzzle done when you're finished? What do you guys see? You see the hole, right? You don't see the beautiful picture, you see the one missing piece. It's so frustrating. And today we're gonna talk about this young rich ruler who had so much to offer, but he didn't come through. So let's double back to verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do you guys see in that one verse about this rich young ruler? What do you guys see in terms of his personality, his character traits? What do you notice there? And I would love it for you guys just to unmute. You guys don't have to mute unless you have like a barking dog in the back. Let's leave your microphone open station what do you guys see about this guy he's pretty excited at first he comes running up to jesus yeah and where's jesus going maybe i didn't pull the context into this i'll just tell you jesus is on his way out of town this passage starts where jesus is leaving town and this man runs up to him like you guys know that feeling when you want to talk to somebody but then you actually see they're leaving what do you do you go oh uh dang, I missed him. Not this guy. So I think Kyle, what you just pointed out was he's determined, like he doesn't keep Jesus on the way. I have a good question. What else can you tell for you body language expert? Yeah, 
Well, he knelt, which I've never noticed before. It's a sign of submission. Totally. Yeah, he got on his knees. Like, he runs up. And think about that. This guy's wealthy. He's got influence. People like that, that don't get on their knees, right? And this guy does. So we know he's determined, humble, and he's respectful. And then how about that question? What do you guys think of the question? Is that a good question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. yeah it, I, I think it might be the best question ever. That's the question that everybody wanted to ask Jesus. That's the question that as soon as they heard this dude, Jesus, and asked that, heads because they couldn't wait to see what Jesus was going to say. So this guy's not only determined, he's not only humble, he's not only respectful, but he's also bold and really smart. He's that that you want in your med school class that asks the question that everybody's afraid of. So in 19, Jesus says, you know the commandments. And he kind of recounts the commandments for him. And in verse 20, this young man says, teacher, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Okay, so picture this scene, guys. Jesus never went anywhere without an entourage, right? He had his disciples with him. And then he had all the people that were following him. And this man comes running up. He asks the best question ever. And all of a sudden, this conversation starts. It's like a tennis match. You can see the group look at the man. And then their heads turn and look at Jesus. And then they go back to the man. And then they go back to Jesus. And they just, they want to know what the answer to this question is going to be. Now, if Jesus had stopped there, this man would walk away pretty happy, right? If Jesus had stopped with the commandments and this man said, hey, I've kept all those commandments since I was born, this man would have walked away going, yes, I'm so glad I talked to Jesus today. But as you and I both know, Jesus was setting him up for the real challenge. So in verse 21, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. I love how this section begins. It says Jesus loved him. In fact, it says Jesus looked at him and loved him. Like Jesus created this man. He knows everything about him. He knew that this man had kept the commandments when he asked that question, but it was a setup to this. So imagine what all the disciples are thinking. They probably knew this guy, right? Because he was wealthy, rich, influential. When this guy came running up to Jesus, I bet his disciples were like, oh, this is awesome. He wants into our group. This guy, I mean, we're a bunch of fishermen. This guy has resources. This guy has influence. Imagine what he can bring. He's a mover and shaker. He's got bank. Imagine how many new followers we're going to have on Instagram if he joins our posse. Well, Jesus does this weird thing. He gives him this command that's darn new to follow. I can just hear the disciples going, uh, Jesus, what are you doing? You got this, this amazing man who wants to follow you. Don't say stuff like that. It's pretty crazy. After Jesus tells him to go sell everything, what does he say? He says, then what? He says, then come, follow me. If you guys can underline that in your Bible, underline it. Those words should should send shivers up your spine because every time Jesus said, come follow me, what was he doing? What was he inviting somebody to do? Be a disciple, right? Be a disciple. Go ahead, research your Bible. Jesus asked that question 15. 12 people said yes. Three people said no. This is one of them. This man actually got the greatest invitation in all the world. And he turned it down. It's funny. It's almost as just saying, hey, you know what? You've given me 499 pieces of your puzzle. I'm looking for the 500th piece. I want you to show me that I'm actually more important than the most important thing to you. This is not a conversation about wealth. It's a conversation about who's sitting on the throne of your life. And he knew that this man's wealth was sitting on the throne of his life. Jesus was saying, you know what? Let go of your stuff and come follow me. He said, let go of it. You're sending treasure up to heaven. 
So instead of having to maintain upkeep all this material wealth that you have here for the next 70 years, why don't you send it up to heaven where there's no upkeep and you get to have it for billions of years? <laughs> Reminds me, you guys probably know who Jim is. He's a missionary that was speared to death in Ecuador when he was 28 years old. And he, came, and he said this famous quote right before he died. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that we not lose. You 20-something-year-olds are really smart. Who says something like that? He's a fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Kyle's like, yeah, I'm smart. I'm a med student. All right, so I don't know about you guys, but my default mode is when there's a decision put in front of me and, and I have to make a, a decision on the spot, like this guy did, Jesus literally gave him a question. And with all those people watching, he had to write there and then like quickly kind of make a decision, quickly look at what he can make that Just waiting. You know, it's the uncomfortable silence. It's hanging in a, are you going to go do that and follow me? And, and this man does what I would have done. Like he knew what he had. He knew what he owned. knew what his wealth was. He knew what his material goods were. That was the known. And then there was the unknown of like following Jesus and like selling all my stuff. And I don't really know what that looks like. And so he did what a lot of us do. He took the known over the unknown. He took the well over the uncomfortable and he went home, to manage his estate for the rest of his life. Now, do you guys know, what's this guy? Did you catch it in, in the passage there? Hey, Tyler. I'm sorry, what was the question? What was, what was this rich young ruler's name? Did you guys catch it? It's not in there, is it? It's not in there. Imagine what happened if this guy would have said yes. Imagine what would have happened to follow Jesus. Here's, yeah, he would have written the Bible. He would have led continents, entire continents to Jesus Christ. He would have had baby boys named after centuries to come. And instead, we don't even know his name because he chose to go home and manage his wealth. So I wanna talk about those four rules that we spoke of earlier. I wanna go through this in the title of the Bible study today, if you wanted a title, if you're that kind of person is how to waste your life, how to waste your life. You guys wanna know how to waste your life? I'm about to tell you. If you have a pen or a journal, I would suggest you write this down. The first rule on how to waste your life, play it safe. Never take a risk. Stay in your comfort zone. To me, it's all the same thing. But wait a sec. You just told me at the beginning of med school, they told you to play it safe, not to take risks and to stay in your comfort zone. I'm telling you right now, you do that, you're going to waste your life. Do you guys know what the one way, who the one-way missionaries were? You ever heard of those, those people? The one-way missionaries were a group of missionaries around the turn of the century that when they decided to go in the mission field, they didn't pack their belongings in suitcases and go. They packed all their belongings in a coffin. They literally put all their belongings in a coffin, got on the ship and went. Why do you think they did that? One paying homage. Yeah, kind of paying homage to the uh, die to yourself and live for me um, idea. Exactly. They're called one-way missionaries because they knew they weren't coming back. When they went on that mission trip, they didn't use a coffin because it was a bigger suitcase and more functional. They packed their coffin that they were going to die in because they knew once they went, they were staying. They were going all in for Christ. They were taking risks. Right now I'm reading about, I love reading about missionaries, man. Every, every missionary has this crazy story. And every time I read it, I'm like, I'm so glad I read that because I just learned so many God strategies and I'm so much bolder now. I'm reading about this guy named John Patton. John Patton was the second missionary to the New Hebrides. New Hebrides are in the South Pacific. They're actually called Vanuatu now. And 
the missionary that went before him in 1848, John Williams, as soon as he got on shore, he was killed and eaten by the cannibals. He didn't even make it 24 hours. Now, what in the world caused John Patton to say, I'm going to go there next. Like, I want to know who does something like that. When his church was trying to talk him out, to, out of it, he, he was from Scotland. One of the elders at his church was trying to talk him out of going to this place where somebody had just been eaten by cannibals. And, and I love his response. I, I, I want to quote it for you. John Patton said, Mr. Dixon, are advancing in years you're now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you, if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. And this guy went there and he worked for three decades and the entire island of 4,000 people became followers of Jesus. Would that have happened if he stayed in his comfort zone and didn't take risks? No. When did we as Americans start believing that God wants to send us into safety to do eatings? You almost physicians, you're going to have the opportunity to do whatever you want with the gifts God's given you and the training that you've put yourself through. And I would just encourage you right now not to play it safe, to take risks and to step out of your comfort zone. Because what God can do with a dead man or a dead woman is unimaginable. So the first rule of wasting your life, play it safe. Second rule, how to waste your life, live for tomorrow. <laughs> Wait a second. I thought you just said living for tomorrow was a good thing. I'm telling you right now, living for tomorrow is the worst thing you can possibly do. On my first day of med school, again, I told you this, everything was ingrained into my brain, delayed gratification, delayed gratification. They, they teach you guys as med students, don't focus on the here and now, this is hard. Just look to the future, to all the good that's coming. And there's this thing called the American dream. The American dream says we're, we're to plan for tomorrow. We're to develop a 401k and a nice retirement account, a good investment portfolio. We're gonna work hard climb the corporate ladder early in our careers. And the whole goal, if we play our cards just right, is to retire young so we can play golf and have fine dining. That's the American dream. Did you guys know that just a few years ago, they finally figured out why there's this huge death spike in 62 year old men? Maybe you guys talked about this in med school. You know, every year, if you look at, at the death, there's a, a nice, constant uptick in, in the percentage of people that die at that age. For some reason at the age of 62 in men, there's a huge spike. It doubles. Twice as many men die at the age of 62 than would be expected. And nobody knows why until the study was done. They finally figured it out. Any guesses? Retirement. Yeah. What about retirement? Well, I know that a lot of people when they retire, they're they suddenly have nothing to do. They suddenly lose a lot of social connection. They lose a lot of meaning and purpose personally in life. And then they either become very depressed. Um, they become physically sort of debilitated. I mean, they, they can lead to all kinds of things like just um, illness, mental illness, all um, things that can all lead to death. Right on, Daniel, right on. So what they discovered was 62 is the age at which you can start collecting social security. And so a lot of men retire at that age. And just like you said, a lot of people place their identity in their career. They're known by others as a doctor. They think of themselves as a doctor or whatever they do. And all of a sudden, just like you said so beautifully, Daniel, they don't know who they are anymore. What do you guys know about doctors that retire? What do they typically do? Play golf. <laughs> they play golf for a little while, and then what do they do after that? They unretire. How many doctors do you know that are like 87 years old and practicing? They retired like 15 years ago, and then they came back. That's what doctors do, because when you're not careful, 
when you hear people call you doctor everywhere you go, you can fall into that trap of actually believing that that's your identity. Mm. Our identity is not in being a doctor. Mm. Our identity is in Jesus Christ. Mm. He's the one that, that died for us. He's the one that made us in his image. He allows us to be gifted and he puts us in medical school and he has a plan for us to be doctors, but that's not our identity. And so living for tomorrow really equates to this. It equates to trying to figure out how you can become as dependent or as, excuse me, as independent as possible, right? How can I become independent, financially secure so that I can retire early and live the good life? Guys, when you start spending all your time planning for tomorrow, you miss out on something really, really important. You miss out on today. A study was just done. It came out two weeks ago and I just laughed because this is so me and maybe this is you too. Sociologists identified, or excuse me, psychologists identified that the average person spends 61% of every minute thinking about something other than the present. Do you guys do that too? I do too. I think about my to-do list. I think about that test that's coming up. I think about something next month. Less than 40% of, of us, or less than 40% of the time, we're actually thinking about the present moment. We're thinking about tomorrow. We spend our today focusing on tomorrow. Jesus says, I'm right here. I'm right here in the present. Stop putting yourself in the future. Stop planning a tomorrow that may not even come. To live fully with me right now. I've got work for you to do. Ephesians 2.10, he's prepared good in advance so that we could walk into it. He's just waiting for us to walk into those good works. And when sometimes we just walk right past them because we're so busy thinking about the future. So want to waste your life? Fall for the American dream. Don't put your focus on today. Be consumed with tomorrow and be consumed with becoming more independent. But you want to live a life beyond your wildest imagination? Start focusing on the present. It's a gift. You might have heard this before. The reason it's called the present is because today is a gift. Stop boasting about your future plans and begin boasting about the one who's going to take you places you could never imagine if you just spend today fully present with him. Third rule on how to waste your life. Place your family first. What? I thought you just said that was a good thing to do. I thought you said that doctors can get so busy in their career that they can sometimes forget about their family. That's true. But here's the deal. The Bible says in Colossians 1.16 that all things were made by him and for him. He didn't make me to walk this planet alone. He didn't make me to walk around here and enjoy myself. He didn't make me just to hang out with my family. Marriage, by the way, is anybody married? Tyler, you're married, Stan, you're married. Okay, you guys know this. Being married is really cool. Like I got married to this awesome woman named Jennifer and I was just like blown away. I'm like, wow, this girl like actually cares about me. Like, she worries about me and she encourages me and she's like all for me. How'd this happen? And she's beautiful. I, I don't deserve this. And the best part is she loves Jesus even more than she loves me which is exactly what I want in my spouse. So imagine my astonishment when I found this verse. Strap in, buckle your seatbelts right now. Are you guys ready for this? 1 Corinthians 7, verse 29. This is what Paul says. He says, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. What is God, or what's God saying there? He's saying, hey, whatever you're into, <clears throat> whatever you're into, don't get too attached to it. It might be really something great, or it might be something not so great. 
a fleeting pleasure, pleasure, whatever it is. I like how Paul says, don't get engrossed in them. Why? Because guys, this life is a prelude. All this life is, is a tryout. It's a tryout for the next life. You only get so many revolutions around the sun, only so many opportunities to take advantage of, to show God that you're trustworthy. It's not about placing your family first. It's about placing the Lord first. How many of you guys, when you pray, you pray to Jesus and you say, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior. You just kind of rattle off those two words, Lord and Savior, Lord and Savior. They kind of go hand in hand. Lord and Savior. Have you ever thought about those words? What are you saying when you call him your Savior? When you call him your Savior, that's an easy one, right? It's really easy for me to say, Jesus, save me. I don't want to go to hell. Please save me. Please be my Savior. That one doesn't require anything from me. That's all on him. How about Lord? When we call him Lord, what are we saying? Have you guys thought about that? This is not on him at all. This is fully on me. When I call him Lord, I'm saying, hey, I actually want to put you on the throne of my life. I'm going to give you full veto power. Whatever you want is what I want. That's why Peter and James and Jude, when they open up their books in the Bible, in their, in their opening verse, it says, in 2 Peter verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, it said, Peter, slave of Jesus Christ. Jude says, Jude, slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. James says in 1-1, one, one, slave of Jesus Christ. Think about that for a minute. Peter was his closest disciple, maybe with the exception of John. Who were James and Jude, by the way? You guys know who they were? Any guesses? Tyler, Tyler the expert. What do you got, Tyler? Tyler, Tyler and Drew are leading our Bible study through James this semester. All right. On the guy's side, yeah. Yeah, James is the half-brother of Jesus. That's right. James was the next brother of Jesus. He was the oldest brother in the family under Jesus. Think about that for a minute. Can you imagine growing up with your big brother being Jesus and you write about him and you say, I'm James. He didn't say I'm James, Jesus' brother. He said I'm James, slave to Jesus Christ. That's what God's saying. So you want to you wanna waste your life? Make your family your number one priority. Place your things first. But if you want to live a life abundant, place Jesus on the throne of your life. Truly make him what you call him when you pray, and that is make him your Lord. And remember, this life is an emergency, guys. I'll tell you right now, the time between medical school for me and today seems like a blink of an eye. And when I think about it, it's that same moment in time that likely exists between my today and the time I leave this earth. A blink of an eye. You guys are going to be here in a moment. Just trust me on this. Life is an emergency. Okay, last one. Last way to waste your life. Are you sitting down for this? Give God almost everything. Give God almost everything. Just like the rich young ruler, do you guys walk around and go, I'm keeping the commands. I've been doing that since I was young. Guess what? That's the normal American Christian response. Yeah, it's true that Americans are you're wealthy and, and grumpy and not real joyful. And then you look at, we go to other countries on mission trips and you see these people that literally have nothing and they are so joyful and they're so sacrificial. And you have to ask yourself, how? Like, why is that happening? What's going on there? Maybe it's because as Americans, we love to hold on to things. It says very clearly in the Bible, we, we all have a choice to make. You can either choose the world or choose Jesus. You can't have both. We all try though. We try to hold like God with one hand and then in the other hand, we like hold the world and we go, hey, I got you, Jesus. 
And Jesus says in Luke 9, 23 and 24, whoever wishes to save their life will lose it. But the one who loses their life for my sake will save it. What does that mean? That means if you try to save, if you try to hold on to the world in one hand, guess what? You're one of those Christians who's given God a 499 piece puzzle. You're not giving them all 500 pieces. You're doing what most Christians do. And you know what? You're a dime a dozen. For God, he's not looking for 499 piece puzzles. He has way too many 499 piece puzzles. He's looking for that person that will give him the 500 piece puzzle. The one who's willing to choose the unknown over the known. The one who's willing to be let out into fields and hills that they've never seen before and could ever never imagine. That's how you live a life abundant. So let's recap. When I was in med school, I was taught to live for tomorrow. It's all about delayed gratification. No, guys. It's about living for today. To play it safe as a surgeon, especially play it safe. Don't take undue risks. Stay in your comfort zone. I can tell you guys unequivocally, leap out of your comfort zone and let God actually be the Lord of your life. Trust where he's going to take you. In med school, I was taught to be incredibly available for my patients, especially early in my career, to give my patients almost everything. Guys, the only thing we're called to do is to give God everything like the rich young ruler didn't do. And then lastly, I was taught in med school, place my family first. Don't forget about my family. And while that's a great rule, guys, it's all about placing God on the throne of your life and keeping him there. He has to be the number one priority. And when he's the number one priority, he sees that you trust him. I think there's a uh, kind of piece of spiritual warfare to it as well that I think is really important. I know uh, Dr. Dyer, we did a Bible study recently where talked about the Israelites getting ready to cross, um, cross the Red Sea. And they told Moses, they just said, you know what? We actually don't want to do this anymore. We'd rather go back into slavery because at least we knew how that was. Um, and we talked about how that was, that was Satan kind of getting in their head and saying like, at least you were comfortable back there. Like you knew what to expect. Um, and I think that's, that's a lot of what we're talking about here as well. Right on Kyle. I love that you have that perspective comfortable the american dream get comfortable get independent and god says no 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 get uncomfortable and get dependent on me that's pretty crazy anybody else have any thoughts on today's bible study or on that video i'm sorry i joined in late but um the that video reminded me of the parable of the talents um where each uh uh each servant has been given a, 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 a certain amount of money in accordance with their skill set, and uh, one of which does not invest it and just buries it in the ground. Um, and uh, then the, the master comes back and is like, why, did, like, why didn't you do anything with it? Uh, and uh, it just reminded me of that. It's yeah, right on, Tyler. And it reminds me of me. It reminds me of, honestly, my life for the first 15 years of my practice. Stay safe. Don't take risks. Keep my family first. And then God called me out of it and he said, you can do that, but you're going to miss what I have for you way up here. You're going to stop short of what I have for you. So I would encourage you guys to, as, you, as you're young physicians and you're getting ready to especially you dan you're almost there getting ready to start your internship and your residency and go out and make your mark on this planet and use your giftedness to give back to the giver i would encourage you guys give god everything don't give him a 499 <clears throat> 499 piece give him a 500 piece puzzle amaze god there's only two times in scripture where it says Jesus was amazed. And both times it was when somebody demonstrated faith that, that 
he hadn't seen before. Be that person that amazes him. And maybe if you guys, while you're in med school or after, if you haven't done it already, I would highly encourage you to consider doing some medical missions. Um, maybe Kyle, you can share the Heartfire web, website with everybody at some point if you want to. But Heartfire, what we do at Heartfire is we, uh, we, we do what a lot of other medical mission organizations do. We, we go to other countries and we operate and we see patients and we try to figure out how to bring more medical equipment and, and operate on more patients and train the local doctors so they don't become dependent. We do all those things, but what we also do is we take out young American pre-med students, med students, nursing students, people that want to do healthcare, and we do crazy things with them on the mission field. And the goal is for you to come back blown away, not just by how you can use your giftedness in this world, but also who Jesus is. Our passion is to make new missionaries. So let me pray for us and, and then I'll be around for a minute or two if you guys have any questions um, or thoughts or you just want to talk about anything, but I just want to talk to God real quick. Lord, I thank you for, for Stan and for Kyle and all these faces on my computer screen. Lord, I hardly know most of them, but I also know that you know them intimately. You made each one. You, you know their journey up to this point. And you know the rest of their journey. You see their whole life in front of you. Lord, you know the good works that you have planned for them. Each one of these people knows that you, you are the reason they're in med school right now. Lord, I thank you that they wanted to take time out, even before a renal quiz coming up later this week, to spend time with you. Lord, I thank you that just like uh, we should be doing, they are demonstrating that you are their Lord just by being here right now. Lord, I ask that you be with each one of these students as they figure out where you're going to be sending them. Some of them in just a few months, some of them in three years, Lord, but you have that already worked out for them. Help them to just rest in that. You know what kind of doctor they're going to be. You know where they're going to be. You know everything about them. And I thank you in advance for the plan that you have for their lives. Lord, I just ask that they just step out of their comfort zone and let you have the reins to take you on that, take them on that adventure that you take dead men and women on, Lord. I thank you for such an opportunity that we don't deserve. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.